Hallå? Hallå? Hallå, dere. Skal vi starte? Så jeg heter Henrik Svensen. Jeg jobber på Institutt for Geofag og Senter for Jordens Utvikling og Dynamikk. Jeg er min kollega av Adriano, og jeg har vært Adriano siden 2004, når jeg flyttet til Oslo. Det er en veldig plære for meg å introduere deg, Adriano. Så en liten del om Adrianos bakgrunn. Adriano er italien. Han gjorde denne master på Universitet av Genova, i kombinasjon med den fri universiteten i Amsterdam. Then he actually um, moved out of academia and worked for about three years for a Western Geophysical Company before going to Aberdeen, uh, doing a PhD on, on the formation of carbonates on the seafloor formed during methane leakage through the seafloor. He moved to Oslo uh, doing a postdoc in 2004, starting working uh, with me and, and colleagues on mud volcanoes in Azerbaijan. And then also a postdoc on um, early Jurassic chemostratigraphy in shales, for those that know what I'm talking about. Uh, in 2006, something happened in Indonesia. Uh, the Lucy eruption started, and that provided a new research path for Adriano, in addition to all other activities that, uh, that, he, that he had. Um, I think a fair way to describe Adriano's research themes is um, where the fields of marine geology, field ge geology, geochemistry and geophysics all meet together. He's also participating in numerous marine cruises and doing fieldwork in places like uh, Barents Sea, Lake Baikal, Brazil, Egypt, Iran, Ukraine, Russia and Argentina. Adrano received ERC starting grant in 2013 for his uh, Lucy Lab project and he will tell us about the results. Please, Adriano. Thank you, Hendrik. Uh, so good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming. And uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, Vitlise asked me to show you some of the results that we collected uh, while we were studying the uh, Lucy eruption site. She highlighted to keep it uh, simple and not too much technical, so I put together a lot of pictures and uh, we will try to go quickly through the technical part. Um, so, but before we, we uh, discuss and before I show you some of the results about uh, the Lucy eruption, I will give a brief introduction about uh, piercements to contextualize uh, the Lucy eruption and why we are uh, studying this kind of uh, geological phenomenon. So, uh, piercements is a geological uh, term, essentially to uh, define the structures that form through the piercing, piercing of sedimentary strata from depth and towards uh, the surface. In this big box, we can put uh, many uh, phenomena, including mud volcanoes, hydrothermal vents, uh, pockmarks, if you like, the watering pipes, the diatremes, and these structures are uh, essentially uh, the manifestation that can reach the surface of solid fraction and fluids that move from depth all the way uh, to the surface. They are, as you see, uh, economically important. Many of them are um, connected to hydrocarbon or to uh, petroleum uh, systems, so they are relevant for the hydrocarbon exploration, for groundwater uh, resources or minerals uh, uh, exploitation, since we have the precipitation of uh, specific minerals inside these conduits. Scientifically, they are relevant because we can uh, investigate the transport of gas from depth all the way to the atmosphere and how this can impact modern and uh, paleoclimates. Uh, early life uh, research, think about deep biosphere. From the social point of view, they are relevant because they represent geohazards, as you will also see in a second. Uh, groundwater research. Uh, there is indeed need to, for all these reasons, to continue the research on, on piercements, uh, to understand the mechanisms and the reactions that are ongoing uh, inside the 
feed the channel from depth to surface. Most of these structures are either uh, fossil, which means they are paleostructures, most of the studies are done on paleostructures, or during their dormancy, which means we can access these structures only between one eruption and another. Otherwise, it is physically impossible to go there. Modeling has been uh, uh, difficult so far because it's very difficult to uh, have a, a clear image of the constraining parameters. And um, if we want to simplify, we can uh, group the piercements in three uh, large families. Uh, we have the hydrothermal systems, which are uh, uh, connected uh, to volcanic systems. I guess you're familiar with those. There were a few presentations here uh, in the previous weeks. Uh, we have mud volcanoes that are entirely uh, related to uh, sedimentary uh, settings. And we have uh, sedimented hydrothermal systems, like the definition by itself, you can, you can guess they are kind of hybrid systems between uh, these two. This is Lucy, by the way, you see we are in the sedimentary basin, but we have the volcanic arc uh, very close to it. So I will briefly introduce each one of them. For those of you that are not familiar, uh, to introduce mud volcanoes, I picked uh, the Caspian Basin, uh, and more specifically in this case is a map of Azerbaijan where you see in the red dots all the mud volcanoes that can be mapped. There are hundreds. Um, and they uh, mostly erupt uh, methane-dominated uh, gas. It can either be thermogenic, which is produced uh, by the uh, baking essentially of uh, uh, organic-rich sediments uh, with uh, higher temperatures or microbial. At shallower uh, depth, at lower uh, temperature, we have the interaction of microbial uh, activity into the organic-rich sediments. But what is uh, very common for the settings for mud volcanoes is that we have the deposition of organic-rich sediments. Uh, a depth, in this case, is the uh, mycopian formation, very proliferous uh, basin in the Caspian. Uh, we have all these sediments are very quickly buried uh, by the input, very high sedimentation rates, and because they are quickly buried, the water molecules between the grains cannot be released, so we are in a condition where we have undercompacted uh, units, very fastly buried, that are uh, gravitative and stable, and they are buoyant. They want to, like a balloon, to grow towards the surface. And we have, because we have uh, organic-rich sediments, we have the production of hydrocarbon-rich fluids, creating overpressure. We have the changes of uh, mineralogical structures of the clay minerals that with higher pressure and temperature, they change their uh, uh, crystal uh, structure, releasing the water molecules that are bond inside the, the mineral uh, cages. So increasing again the overpressure, increasing the amount of water, and ultimately we have on the surface uh, mud volcanoes that may intersect uh, hydrocarbon uh, reservoirs. Just to give you some example, hopefully this will work. Uh, this is some eruptions in Trinidad and the Sea of Azov. Uh, they are very powerful. They last uh, typically a few days, which is the time required for the overpressure created the depth to be released uh, towards the surface. With time, they can form large structures, they are mountains, up to 700, one kilometer high, 10 kilometers uh, in, uh, in uh, width, and we can access them inside the crater during their dormancy and collect fluids from these bubbling sites that are inside the crater. That's, so that, that's how we, we study them. Hydrothermal systems are CO2 dominated, we're talking about Mantelic CO2 related to the uh, magma located at depth. We have geyser, geysers, mud, mud pots uh, as example. Uh, we have a system with very high enthalpy, a high temperature, where the fluids, we have a convective system of meteoric water which is circulating, and at the surface we may have 
uh, hydrothermal springs, geysers, fumaroles, and, and so on. So some examples uh, of some of the spectacular uh, hydrothermal systems. You may recognize some of them. They can be onshore, uh, offshore, where we have chemosymbiotic communities uh, thriving around these sites. Onshore, we have uh, other type of communities that uh, like this, these places. And one of the classic examples is the Yellowstone. We have some mud pots also in Yellowstone. Some people call them mud volcanoes, but they, they are, in fact, not mud volcanoes. The fact that we have mud is entirely related to the fact that the acidity of the fluids are breaking apart the volcanic rocks, and therefore we have some portions of mud in the system. And finally, we have sediment-hosted uh, hydrothermal systems. We have a mix, if you remember the two gases I was pointing out uh, earlier on, of uh, CO2 and methane, CO2 mantelic. Methane is related to the sedimentary setting. And we have the intrusion of uh, magma and hydrothermal fluids inside organic rich sediments. They are triggering uh, metamorphic reactions, essentially baking the organics in the rocks, in generating gas, increasing the overpressure. They want to be released, and then we have the hydrothermal vents that manifest to the surface. Uh, this is uh, Lucy, for example. We have uh, paleo examples in South Africa, offshore Norway, Paleocene Eocene in uh, Siberia. This is an example of uh, uh, Salton Sea in, uh, in California. So this is what we, we will look at today. They can be very uh, spectacular and uh, very powerful when they are active. And uh, so I will now uh, move on into Lucy, and I will show you some of the results of the Lucy Lab uh, project. As uh, Hendrik uh, said, it's a, it's a ERC grant hosted here at, the, at SEED, at the University of Oslo. We put together a large team with many institutes, European institutes and uh, Indonesian institutes. Uh, so we could basically tackle this, uh, this, um, this nice example with, def with different disciplines, each each one of these institutes has his own uh, speciality, specialization in some, in some uh, disciplines. So we, we put together a multidisciplinary uh, approach for it. A brief introduction about uh, what happened. The 27th of May 2006, we had a large strike slip, lateral earthquake in uh, Jakarta, and basically Less than two days later, we have several eruptions occurring in uh, northeast Java, aligned eruptions. And today, we are in a situation where we have an area of seven uh, square kilometers, uh, entirely covered by mud. Uh, we have three uh, gazering uh, vents that are pulsating. Uh, they can erupt peaks of uh, fluids. The flow rate can reach up to 180,000 cubic meters per day. 60,000 people had to be evacuated. And after the eruption started, as some of you may know, this initiated the debate if it was triggered by uh, drilling or, uh, or if it's a natural uh, event. I will not uh, go into this uh, debate. I will not discuss the drilling data, but I will show you our uh, field observations at site. So why Lucy? Because it's a unique opportunity to observe uh, the evolution of a piercement structure from day one. Uh, we could combine drilling data. The Northeast Java is a petroleum uh, province, so there is a lot of seismic data available, uh, borals throughout uh, the island, and we could monitor the activity very easily from day one, and it's something that cannot happen anywhere else. As you will see, they built some dams around the, the main crater, so we could access uh, very easily, uh, relatively easily, the crater to uh, do observations and collect uh, samples. So I'll quickly show you uh, what happened, so you get an idea about uh, the the scale of this uh, of this event. We essentially moving from a situation where we have a city. Uh, this is the main highway, highway connecting the northern part of Java to towards the south, and few weeks after the 
eruption, the eruption started, uh, the area got quickly covered uh, by mud. So just pick a, any reference point that you like, and you will see how this area gets bigger and bigger. Uh, the authorities spent a lot of money trying to protect the houses, so they were building uh, polygons with high embankments, trying to stop the mud to uh, essentially flood all the city. And the, of course, the eruption continued, and this area got bigger and bigger, and they started to flush the mud into, into the river. And you see now, very soon, the highway will not be uh, used anymore. But what is the nice thing for us, you will see other pictures in a second, is that we could go very close to the crater and uh, look, at, look at the eruption site. And again, definitely the monsoon and the tropical rain didn't help. And after 2008, this embankment, uh, they, I mean, essentially the whole area was collapsing, like a caldera collapse and they had to replenish this embankment with adding material just to keep it afloat above the surface. So they stopped this operation and then the crater was inaccessible uh, since then. And today, then this part was also taken inside. Today we are in this situation where we have essentially a seven square kilometers, largest uh, swimming pool on the planet uh, full of mud. Uh, we can access during the dry season very close to the crater, up to 300 meters away from, from the crater. Uh, then this is a no-go area where you essentially die because it's boiling mud. Um, so some images about uh, how it looked like at the beginning. It was several tens of meters uh, blasts of mud into, into the air covering streets, street lights, factories, houses. Uh, this is initial construction of the dam around the crater. It's a massive uh, construction. You see this is a truck, this is several tens of meters high. They basically managed to create a superposed uh, level for the crater since the intention was to flush the mud towards the south, towards the river. And this is how they continue to keep it uh, uh, up to the surface. So we could go there, sometimes not so easy, sometimes a bit more uh, complicated, uh, but this is a picture of a, a gazering a phase uh, framing exactly the embankment around. And the area become, became bigger and bigger, covering everything until at the end you couldn't you couldn't see the end, basically, of this uh, mud flood. So, mud volcanism uh, in uh, Java is actually a very common phenomenon. You see the white dots here represent the mud volcanoes that uh, we studied and we mapped. Uh, the setting here is uh, basically the same of the Caspian Sea that I showed. It's a fastly buried sedimentary basin with a buoyant and unstable uh, units. It's, an, uh, it's a petroleum province, so we have also production of uh, hydrocarbons here. So, we have, we, as you know, we have the subduction zone to the south of Java, we have the volcanic arc just in front of it, and Lucy is essentially positioned here in the back arc basin, which is this white dot. The volcanic arc goes east-west uh, here. We are in extensional regime, high sedimentation rate, organic rich sediments, which is very ideal. And if you look at the seismics, we know that in the geological past, similar uh, piercement and large eruptions occurred. This is a paleo vent structure, which is now buried, can only be observed with the seismics, and some of paleo systems can be also observed uh, on the field. So what happened after uh, the earthquake in 2006, what was observed is that in the uh, uh, gas fields located around Lucy, which is here, 
and in the water wells in the northern part of the island, we had a sudden uh, uh, pressure drop indicating that the fluids were flushed away towards a central area, which is this dashed line, which as you will see in a second, is a strike slip uh, fault system that extends from the volcanic arc towards the, nor the northeast of the island. And along the same fault, we have other uh, mud volcanoes that after the earthquake were reported to have uh, higher activity. Simultaneously, Semeru and Merapi, uh, two large uh, volcanoes in, the, in Java, also had stronger activity uh, after this uh, seismic event. So the strike slip faulting, uh, if you can follow me, we have the um, volcanic arc here to the, to the south, we have Lucy, and we have a system of uh, lateral shearing uh, faults that originate from the volcanic arc and goes towards the northeast of the island. So this is an important uh, structure that can also be observed on the, on the seismic lines that go through the island. What we had was not one eruption, was actually several eruption points. These are numbered in chronology that were distributed uh, along one kilometer following the same orientation of this uh, uh, fault system. You see some examples here. There's one here, one over there, one over there, one behind there and some more farther uh, to, the, to the south that we, we don't see in this image. We could see that from the seismic profiles that were acquired in the 90s, so well before Lucy appeared, we had a, a growing piercement depth at this locality, indicating that there was a situation of overpressure already uh, present at depth. And what we observed, again, is a system of fractures that developed uh, with the same direction of the strike-slip system. And also interest is how the uh, area around Lucy evolved in the following months. So we have a subsidence of the area that was ellipsoidal following the same orientation of this, of this fault system, indicating that everything is connected together. So in 2009, we proposed this scenario. We know that we have a pre-existing dome-shaped structure at depth we know that through the fractures, the system, the fault system was reactivated and we had many eruption sites indicating that the fluids were flushed away from uh, the, the aquifer and appearing to the surface and finally one eruption is covering uh, everything else with a prominent crater. We tried to uh, validate this scenario using a laboratory simulation and numerical modeling. Uh, it worked actually very well, show you some images we used. We built a large tank in the laboratory, filling it up with a different type of media and distributing an overpressure in the subsurface, which was uh, not able to appear on the surface. Uh, but as soon as we shear this large tank in two sides, simulating the, the fault, uh, we see that the fluids migrate towards the sheared area and appear on the surface. So we used different types. This is low cohesion, high permeability, uh, same results, or low cohesion, uh, low permeability. A few words about uh, geochemistry. Um, what we did, we of course collected samples from the crater. We collected samples from the thousands of seeps that are around the crater inside this large embankment zone. Think about, uh, I don't know, think about a tree with the branches, and the, so the trunk is the Lucy conduit, and the branches are the lateral satellite seeps that uh, distribute in the area around Lucy. We compared the geochemistry with the fluids, the, with the gas from the gas fields nearby, with the other uh, mud volcanoes in the area, and from the fumaroles and the hydrothermal springs in the volcanic complex. So don't look at the plots if you're not particularly interested, but the bottom message is that we have thermogenic methane that is erupted at Lucy, indicating that it is very fresh and that originates from four to five kilometers uh, uh, depth. So indicating the 
the, the, the conduit is very open up to uh, uh, high uh, depth. Similar results we have from CO2 and helium gas geochemistry. Again, the, the message is that we have uh, mantelic CO2 and mantelic helium. If you remember, we have this combination of volcanic fluids and uh, sedimentary fluids like methane. And also interesting is that in order to produce the kind of gas that we have on the surface, we need to invoke, uh, we need to have temperatures up to 400 degrees, and this kind of temperature is higher than the gradient that was measured at the site before the eruptions. So in other words, if we want to have this type of gas, we need to invoke the input of an extra heat source in the system to explain uh, this kind of gas. We went all the way to the top of the fumaroles here. Here is Lucy, here is the first cone, here is the main volcanic complex. Quite an adventurous uh, mission, up to 3,000 meters. We sampled for the first time uh, the fumaroles. And essentially, uh, we could prove that the gas at the volcanic complex and at Lucy, they have essentially the same uh, composition, indicating that somewhere at depth, the, these two systems are connected between each other. Same with water, we collected uh, water samples. Uh, again, even water is supporting the theory that we have uh, evidence of input of hydrothermal fluids entering our system. So we designed uh, I mean, if you want, we were able to trace back each single component through our stratigraphic uh, log at the site. But the main message is that both for water and gas, it's very clear that we have uh, the migration of uh, hot fluids at depth that come to the surface. That's why we suggested that at depth, these two systems are connected. Uh, increasing the temperature, producing new fluids that are finally expelled on the surface. And you see here, indeed, we are relatively close to the volcanic complex. And if you wonder how we got there, I probably have, a, if it works, a video. Um, we constructed a drone. Uh, you see the fractures of the caldera collapse here and now we will fly towards uh, the crater in a boiling yogurt uh, zone uh, here, all the way to the active uh, crater. We selected a moment where there is low activity of the, of the crater, otherwise the drone would be blasted away. As I said, it has phases of gathering, and you will see traces of uh, hydrocarbons and oil, and if you look somewhere around here, you will see some bubbling, but so we were able to fly inside the, the plume at the crater site and uh, collect uh, samples of, uh, of gas, water, and, and, and mud. Uh, let's go back here. So we developed uh, this uh, drone uh, ourselves. It's an exocopter. It's versatile, light in weight, easy to transport, uh, multipurpose can access extreme environments. We, uh, you can fly it manually or you can preset the path of the drone using a software. Uh, so you, you can decide if you want to do photogrammetry, for example, define polygons. Uh, we equipped it with uh, several uh, payloads that we constructed ourselves with pre-vacuumed uh, tubes that you can activate remotely once you fly inside the plume. We uh, constructed a remote controlled winch that you can basically lower down your instruments uh, in the crater, taking samples of mud, water, uh, doing point temperature measurements, uh, or with the infrared uh, camera. You see some, some examples here of the plume. Uh, and then we hover on the plume and we deploy our, our instruments. Henrik suggested to show also this video, if it works. It's, uh, mm, it's actually 
again, uh, we, are, we are approaching this uh, zone where we cannot walk uh, any further. In this case, you have two craters. You see the streams that are discharging the water that is expelled. And if you have maybe binoculars or if you are very careful, you will see that here there is another drone. So we did a, a movie with two drones following uh, each other. And again, uh, hopefully you will be able to see when the drone uh, stops over the crater and deploys the instruments to, to collect uh, samples. You can, again, this is a low uh, activity uh, moment that we selected. So you will see now, hopefully here, we are deploying the instruments uh, to collect, in this case, we are collecting mud for analysis, for microbial analysis to uh, do incubations. Here you go, you, you see the, the sampler. Uh, we are doing incubations of mud to uh, search for uh, life in the mud. And it appears to be the case, actually. We found evidence of uh, microbial activity, although the temperature is, uh, is very high. So we move to back to our presentation. Uh, what we did also is uh, uh, photogrammetry of uh, infrared uh, pictures. We were able to construct a mosaic of the crater area. And what was really surprising for us is that uh, the crater uh, is about, let's say, 100 meters but it's, we have different rings of temperature inside the crater. So we are hot, colder, hot again. Uh, so we have this system and we uh, uh, model this system where we have uh, hot fluids coming up in the central area. Uh, as soon as the, flu the, the mud comes up, it cools down, then sinks again. And we have this kind of uh, uh, cells inside the, the funnel shaped uh, caldera zone. You see a lot of hydrocarbons, but you wouldn't be able to you wouldn't be able to see this, this kind of pattern on the, on the visual image, visual mosaic. What we did also, we collected samples at the crater site of all the clusts that were erupted. We, we have a large collection of clusts, and in particular, we focused on the deepest stratigraphy, dating the samples, and we were able to show that uh, we have clusts coming all the way from uh, four kilometers. These clusters are present at, uh, at the, at the, were sampled during the early phases of the, of the eruption, indicating that even at the very beginning, we already had, a, uh, uh, if you want, a, a overpressure present at depth at four and a half kilometer, able to push up the, these clusters all the way to the surface. And these are basically the uh, formations that we were able to, to trace back using the clust. So it's like if you want a, a drilling site uh, looking at the clusts that are erupted and mixed together uh, on the surface. Uh, what we also did, we did some microthermometry on the erupted clusts. Um, in particular, I'm showing you in this case the temperature of the deepest cluster from four kilometers. I mean, what we are interested in really is, is, is this part of the figure. And as you know, uh, during the burial of uh, rocks, we have the precipitation of minerals inside the rocks due to the increase of pressure and temperature. So these new minerals are precipitating at uh, increasing uh, conditions of, of pressure and temperature. And what we were able to, 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 to see doing the microthermometry of these specific targetly uh, minerals is that we have a, a nice uh, trend of temperature increase, which is reflecting the gradual burial of our clusters. But superposed to that, we have a second generation of minerals indicating a second trend of hotter temperatures up to nearly uh, 300 degrees. So indicating that our naturally buried system at some point in its life was uh, affected by the intrusion of uh, hot fluids that initiated the precipitation of new minerals at, uh, at higher temperature in the system. And this is probably the, 
intrusion, the magmatic intrusion and the hydrothermal fluids migration that entered at some point in the geological time into our, our basin. We measured uh, the seismicity, but what, what is interesting is that the Lucy system is responding to seismicity. You know we have this, Indonesia is an is a, uh, earthquakes uh, prone uh, uh, region and we have uh, dislocations up to several meters in the, in the embankment uh, area just after seismic events. We have the appearance of uh, two craters after the seismic events. Uh, in this case, if we look at this is the fault system that goes towards the northeast. And here we have the, the dam. It was breached uh, exactly after the, the earthquake, indicating that, the, that our system is very responsive to, to the seismicity. What we also did, we distributed for two years a network of seismometers, 31 seismometers, around the volcanic complex, around Lucy, and along the uh, uh, strike slip system. Um, and what we were able to see is that there is most of the seismic activity is uh, concentrated below the volcanic arc, indicating that the magma chamber is, is active. But, and by the way, they have a, a lateral uh, uh, shearing uh, component, but inside the sedimentary basin uh, we don't see much uh, seismicity. And this was to us very surprising because on the field we can observe very clearly that we have shearing ongoing in the area. Uh, you see you have even some strike slip uh, uh, indications, but we explain this by the fact that the, the back arc basin close this area essentially it's uh, rich in fluids, so the shearing is occurring, it's like a creeping, it's occurring very slowly and not like a sudden, sudden sleep like uh, we observe for most common uh, earthquakes. This is another example that occurred after, after an earthquake. You see the uh, fault escarpment here, the volcano in the background here, and this nice system of faults that connects the two. Of course, we were also uh, looking at the geophysical data. We were, as I said, we were able to reconstruct the full uh, stratigraphy uh, at this site um, and uh, know that uh, the Lucy system is as deep as uh, four kilometers. Uh, we did uh, using, exploiting the data from the network, uh, ambient noise uh, tomography and uh, we had uh, a very nice uh, subsurface image of the area. If you look at this line here, is essentially the line uh, here, which is parallel to the strike slip system intersecting the volcanic arc and Lucy here. What we have is a magma chamber located below the volcanic arc, a hydrothermal plume, of course, below Lucy, but the two systems are very nicely connected, indicating that magma and uh, hydrothermal fluids are uh, moving inside towards the sedimentary basin and they're finally reappearing to the surface at Lucy. These sections, by the way, are perpendicular to this line, so you see the hydrothermal plume and the nicely focused migration of fluids. It's like a, like a corridor. In this image, you probably see better if you Okay, again, we have the uh, volcanic complex here, Lucy here, we have the Lucy conduit at depth, and this nice connection at about four and a half kilometers between the two systems, indicating this, this uh, very nice migration into the sedimentary basin. So this was uh, finally supporting uh, our scenario that the heat temperature uh, the, the, the temperature increase into the sedimentary basin was essentially baking the organic rich sediments of the source rock and generating new gas, a new overpressure at depth, creating this system in uh, unstable conditions that was able uh, to manifest on the surface at the first, uh, at the first uh, external, uh, external perturbation. Uh, we did some uh, modeling, 
try to understand, try to quantify how much uh, gas could be produced by a potential intrusion into the uh, uh, organic rich sediments that we know are there, of which we know the parameters, and we can produce uh, a large amount of, uh, of megatons uh, of CO2 at depth. Again, validating the scenario that this, this, uh, this heat, this intrusion, could uh, uh, create uh, the overpressure required to, to manifest to the surface. So, um, as you have seen, this is uh, not only Lucy, but the whole area can be considered as a multidisciplinary laboratory. Uh, we were monitoring the seismicity. This area is affected by seismicity constantly. Every day we have uh, uh, seismic events. We were focusing on uh, volcanism, studying the volcanic arc, the fluid flow of an active open system, which is Lucy, and these two systems are connected by this uh, uh, shear, shear system. I don't know, there was a video here that was shown. FC, doesn't matter. And, uh, and ultimately, I, I didn't show it here, but we were able to propose some models, numerical models, to explain all the observations that um, we, we have uh, collected on the field. We produced uh, several articles reporting our, our results. And um, I will conclude uh, with two provocative uh, slides, if you like. Uh, if you look at how the cones in the volcanic uh, complex are distributed, they move from the oldest to the south, uh, with the youngest to the north. So essentially this volcanic complex was growing on, on this direction. And perhaps not by coincidence, this is the same direction of the strike-slip system that extends towards the northeast of the, of the island. And Lucy is, by the way, uh, here. So the question now is if uh, this strike-slip system is controlling the evolution of the, of the volcanic arc. Uh, you see it here you have the, the volcano, the fault here, the river is bent, we have a large escarpment you have seen in the pictures earlier on, and you have Lucy and other mud volcanoes farther to the north. So maybe, who knows, uh, this could be could represent the natural evolution of our volcanic system entering uh, naturally the, the, the basin of the island and, and uh, new features could appear at the surface. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Is there any questions? Is it any uh, uh, risk for that uh, it will be a sudden explosion in uh, Lucy? I mean, the, the, the system is active constantly. So it's continuously erupting and we have these geysering phases every 30 minutes approximately. Um, but at the moment is, is, is mud, mud blasts that we, that we have. So it's uh, well contained in a way. And uh, the authorities created uh, a buffer zone around the embankment to prevent additional disasters in, in, in case this embankment will, uh, will get damaged and fracture. So the, the area that can potentially be flooded will not, be, will not affect as many people. Please. Uh, that very nice talk, thank you. Um, really enjoyed it. Uh, my question is, uh, you were saying that you guys went up to kind of like 300 meters uh, close to the, to the crater at some point when they still had these uh, dams around. Now the dams are around the crater, it's a f few meters like me and you. But how, uh, I'm just like, yeah. How how uh, stable or unstable really these uh, erupted uh, mud plains? 
around the crater and also further away that's uh, hundreds or maybe a few kilometers away like how stable or unstable are these uh, mud planes really uh, is there any you mean the embankment uh, no, no, mud. the mud that erupted, because that's several meters thick, isn't it? And you guys were walking. Uh, you had some pictures where uh, you were, yeah, like here, for example, you are really close to the... Uh -huh. uh, I mean, it just, to me, it seems very dangerous. <laughs> yeah, okay, you, you wait maybe for the moment where it's not as active, and then you, you try to collect uh, your samples. Um, okay, you, you, you didn't get my question. So the, there are lots of mud that uh, came out on the surface. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you have basically mud plains around that uh, covered the city, and you were basically walking on this uh, okay. mud. So that, that's what you mean? Yeah. So how stable or unstable is uh, that? <laughs> not so stable. I mean, uh, you can you can walk. Yeah, that's but then what I mean. Yeah, that's exactly what I meant. So you guys we actually drilled, and, th and we know more or less the thickness of, of of the dry part. But that can change during the years and during the season, uh, if yeah. it's the rainy season or not. But the closer you go, the s the the more you start sinking in the mud, and then you understand that, that you shouldn't go any further. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's why we constructed the drone to access. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, how deep is uh, your crater inside, Lucy? Do you have any idea about the, the depth inside? You mean the funnel zone before yeah. it, it yeah. focuses on a, on a conduit, on a single yes. conduit? Yes. Uh, this is difficult. Di this is difficult to say. But uh, we did some uh, uh, some monitoring, uh, and uh, we believe I have. A, I, I actually should have a slide. But it's about uh, yeah. It's about uh, 300 meters or something like this. Uh, we are about uh, 200, 250 meters. Yeah, and then it, uh, then it focuses on a funneled point. In 2007, I think, uh, the government uh, had a program attempting to stop uh, uh, this uh, eruption site. So what they were doing, they were uh, dropping inside the crater uh, cl clusters of uh, concrete uh, bolts. And the idea was to put i don't know how many hundreds of this uh, of this uh, these concrete balls uh, they put basically two cranes on the opposite uh, sides of the crater connected by a pulley system and then they were dropping inside concrete balls the idea was to reduce uh, ideally the diameter of this and r reduce the flow rate of course, it didn't work, but uh, what, uh, what we know is that at, at the time uh, they, they could deploy these balls up to 300 meters, it was free fall. I mean, there was no, they were not reaching uh, the bottom. And then after 300, they were uh, unlocking the system and let it go. So uh, it's at least 300. If the, if there was any new eruption, did those uh, concrete uh, bottle ejected in the in the <laughs> in the surface? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs>